Uh, so, as always, you can get in touch with us on the mailing list. Uh, if you sign in there, you can hook us. You can get hooked up there. We also now have a link on the website, I believe, that you can click to. You can click on. Uh, we do have a website where we post information. Uh, we post a weekly, at least once, to update um, where our meetings are and what we're talking about. Check us out on Slack as well, because that's where we talk about things. Uh, people who are interested in security, like myself in particular and a handful of other of us, um, always, if I find something interesting security related, I just post in Slack, I'll link to it. Um, so that's a good way to get security news if you're looking to do that as well, or ask questions. Uh, and lastly, we have our email address, utdcsg at gmail.com. If you have any questions, you can always reach us there. If you really have a time sensitive question, just hit us up on Slack. We check that email once every day or every other day. Slack, I will get a notification on my phone. So I will actually answer your question there uh, if you're trying to get in touch with us. Announcements, like Jake said, we have lag of Hangouts, ECS 4.619, 4, 4 p.m. Thursday. Uh, last week, we talked about password security. Um, fun stuff. And we also did our penetration testing session. Oh, and to clarify on that, if you want to like ask a question about anything, like learn more, just come pick our brains. Feel free to come. If you have no idea what you want to talk about, feel free to come and have discussion. Um, either way, uh, we don't really have a set schedule for what we're doing there. And our penetration testing session. Oh yeah, he has a thing tomorrow. He'll be going over. Uh, I hacked the box box. So that's binary exploitation and penetration testing. You should check it out. It's going to be cool. Uh, penetration testing session we did Saturday. Uh, Andrew walked through a vulnerable Linux box. We have a two-hour recording of it. It's pretty fun. It goes through a realistic expectation for the penetration testing process. Uh, that was a new box to Andrew. He had never seen it before. And so it, it showed how frustrating it can be. And it was a fairly accurate depiction of at least with I've what, what I have experienced with penetra penetration testing. A lot of the videos you see online don't really do that justice. They just show, oh, I found all these solutions. And they solve a box in 20 minutes. And it was a really hard box. And you're just like, how the heck did they do that? Andrew actually walks through his thought process, and people in, who were sitting in the room gave him ideas. And so you can actually see the trial and error process. So it's worth, um, if you're really curious on how it would look, uh, it's worth looking at. And so uh, the overview. Today we're doing sim and more. Uh, the and more is because sim by itself is boring and fairly bland. So we move on to doing more things. We have a getting started, doing sim, what's beyond sim, threat intel, and hunting. Uh, should be a fun meeting. So as far as getting started goes, uh, security infrastructure, particularly when you get into things like SIM and more complicated tooling, or complicated, I guess, in quotes, it can be very hard to get started. And like that's something that I faced when I started getting into this kind of stuff. It's something I think everyone has faced as they get into trying to learn how these tools work and how they integrate together. Uh, and it's a hard problem. And fortunately, other people have had this problem and developed solutions to get around it. And so if you're looking for an all-in-one encompassed Security Appliance. Uh, the Security Onion is a great place to get started. It has a bunch of tooling already set up that has everything you should need to actually penetrate, actually detect attacks on your network. Uh, and it's already more or less pre-configured, ready to go. I have mixed opinions about these kinds of things. Uh, it's kind of like the blue teaming experience for Kali. It has a lot on it. And so your experience may be kind of slow and bloated uh, the configurations for the tools you may not like particularly. Uh, and so that you have to keep that in mind as you deal with it. But overall, it's a great experience for getting started. It has a SIM set up for you ready to go. It has a bunch of detectors set up ready to go. If you're just curious how it works, it's great. Um, another, I, I left this one off because I haven't actually gotten it to work. But Alien Vault OSIM, uh, OSSIM, also exists. It's another virtual appliance that supposedly works. Uh, I don't know anyone who's actually gotten it to work, but there are CVEs for it that I saw recently. Uh, and so clearly someone is using it and attacking it. So it clearly exists in some form or fashion. I just have no experience with it, nor did I find it easy to get to use. Uh, so that's try if you want. Uh, and lastly, and my favorite, Docker. Um, no one really considers Docker in a security context as far as learning security tooling. But a lot of the more modern tooling is developed with Docker containers ready to go uh, and also ready to deploy it as Docker containers, but that's less applicable here. Learn how to use Docker containers simply for the fact that tooling is really easy to spin up if it's a Docker container. Uh, if you understand how Docker works, you don't have to understand any of the infrastructure behind the tooling, assuming it's written well. Uh, it will just be able to spin it up and try it. Uh, both the demos today are written in Docker containers. And one of them, 
I didn't have to do any work to get it set up. It just, I ran a couple commands that they gave me and they spin up their own test instance to get it started. Really, really worth getting started to learn uh, because if you want to try new things, Docker should make that easy if the application you're trying to run wrote a Docker container for you. So actually on to Sim. Sim is security information and event management. Uh, it's a large, r big set of words, uh, an annoying acronym like most security things are, and doesn't give you a lot of information about what it is. Uh, but it aggregates incoming information from network sensors. So this could be your IDS solution, this could be an IPS solution, this could be a honeypot, this could be your firewall, this could be a whole host of things. Anything that can detect security events and instance can feed information into your SIM tool. And that's really the point of it. It's designed to allow a single pane of glass, um, an expression used for a tool that prevent, presents itself generally in a browser window for a security analyst or any analyst of a kind, uh, to see the current state of your security of your network. Very handy for detecting threats, very handy for identifying threats, very handy for responding to incidents. And it overall should be giving an analyst an idea of what's going on in the network and what they need to be doing immediately. It also should incorporate alerts. And so if you're on a 24 by 7 team that gets alerts from your SIM tool, it's quite possible you'll be getting a phone call from your SIM tool saying we have an incident. Um, that's the overall role of the SIM tool. It's an aggregation platform. And just for clarification, uh, something that confused me when I first got started in security and something that's not well explained a lot of the time is a difference between an event and an incident. An event is going to be a real thing that happened. That could be someone trying to log into an SSH server. That could be someone, a real user, successfully logging into a, an SSH server and no problems are found. Like that's a valid event that could happen and likely will be found in your SIM tool. An incident is a security problem. This means, and that's, so problems is in quotes for a reason. For someone who configured SSH well and root isn't available to log in, Brute forcing root logins is not, at least in my opinion, a security incident because it will never work. But if someone is brute forcing my personal account that has a password and perhaps it's a weak password, then that may be an incident. Uh, that just depends upon how me or the security analyst or security architect defines an incident. Uh, but overall, incidents should be actionable for an analyst. An incident should have either an automated response or an analyst response to it whether that's a low-level analyst who's just checking to make sure things are okay, or whether that's a high-level security event uh, or security incident that requires a lot of interaction. Now, and so that's SIM tools should be cataloging events and displaying incidents uh, as an idea. So overall, the goal, you should be able to alert analysts of incidents and give them the ability to correlate that back with events. Just because an attacker Let's say we have a rogue IP address from China, logs in over SSH, and that is counted as an incident on my team. It is not useful to know that, or not as useful to know that, without knowing they've been trying to brute force the login for the last two weeks. Uh, that's in a kind of event that would then correlate with the incident, which is useful to have an ASIM tool. And that's overall the goal of ASIM tool, is to provide as much information as necessary and available to the analyst himself or herself. So in examples of SIM tools, uh, IBM has one called QRadar. It's fairly neat. It's, I do believe it's sold as an appliance, so you just plug it into your rack. Really expensive. Uh, it can handle a lot of data, though, and also comes with or can be used with IBM Big Fix, which is their... I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of like their network... It's their endpoint protection software. And so you can have uh, incidents in QRadar spin up things in Big Fix, and Big Fix will go and try to fix them. So if you're really interested in that, like IBM's platform suite in particular, there's a really neat video on YouTube of this guy who spins up QRadar in Big Fix and uses it to catch and stop WannaCry malware, which is fairly neat. Uh, IB HP ArcSight, uh, another SIM tool I wasn't aware of until an employer or a, a yeah an employer who came in recently discussed that that was their SIM tool. Uh, if you were here, you know who that was, or if you know who's coming, uh, but I don't want to, to disclose any more information than they gave us. Uh, but it's another example. Uh, Splunk is a log aggregation software, uh, but it also can be used by a SIM tool and has been used by SIM tools as a SIM tool for other people. And then finally, ElasticSec, which is the open source SIM tool that I like the best. And it's decently heralded as a good option 
for a sim tool by the security enthusiast community. There's quite a few bloggers who are going around currently using Elastic Stack as a sim tool and using different tooling with Elastic Stack to have a good security architecture. If you're looking at Security Onion, they're currently using another platform as their sim tool. I don't remember what it's called, uh, but they're moving to Elastic Stack in their new beta, I believe. Um, it should be switched soon to Elastic Stack. It's fairly neat. And so a demo of Elk plus Cowry should be fairly neat. So we're in my sim container, sim directory. We have a Docker Compose file, which if you've never used Docker Compose before, it allows you to do container orchestration on your local host. So I can spin up a bunch of containers and have them work together. So we have Elasticsearch, which is a database for storing information. Uh, it's very popular for storing log data, but it also helps for security events and incidents. Logstash, which is somewhat of a go-between. Uh, information is sent to Logstash. Logstash sends itself, sends that information on to Elasticsearch. Kibana, which is the front end. Kauri, which is an SSH honeypot. It is used to take, it's a, it's a way for you to, sorry. <laughs> I, I say um a lot when I present and I'm trying not to and it causes me to stumble, so my bad. We have a Kauri honeypot which you spin up and it's designed to allow you to identify what an attacker is doing and what you think they might want to do. And so you can spin up this vulnerable SSH service that allows people to log in and you can track what they're doing. And so in this case, I will log into the Kauri honeypot and you'll be able to see exactly what I'm doing pop up in Kibana. It's really neat. And then FileBeat is a small binary that allows you to uh, tail log files and send them into Logstash or Elasticsearch, either way. So we will run it. And it takes a little while to spin up, unfortunately, because all of this is relatively heavy software. Uh, if I was going to have one complaint about the Elastic Stack as a whole, is it's very heavy. To make sure Cowrie doesn't fail, it may fail, unfortunately. The Cowrie Docker container is not the highest of quality. So it may or may not come up. But as you can see, all these different containers are spinning up and slowly making themselves live. And so we can come back to this because this may take a decent amount of time. So going beyond Sim, Sim doesn't do everything, unfortunately. Um, it only is good, as good as the rules you provide it, as far as your network sensing tools are, are, are as, long, as far as your network sensing tools uh, are aware of their rule set or w rule sets that you actually put in the Sim tool. So I'm trying to detect an event and turn it into an incident like SSH brute force logins. That may not actually happen if my rules are bad. And so the sim tool itself is only as good as the rule set you have and the writers of rules that you have. And then you also have the problem of analysts may find themselves doing very repetitive tasks. If an incident comes up frequently that is very easy to solve and for some reason keeps happening, your analysts may do the same thing over and over again, and that's really not useful for anyone on the team. And Sim doesn't really handle that well. So we move on to a relatively new concept in security, uh, user and entity behavior analytics. It's the idea that we can look at what our users and entities, so servers, anything that would be on your network, do regularly, and try to determine a baseline from that. It's, it's hard to do, and there's no open source software to do it, and so I can't give, explain hands-on experience, but it's trying to use machine learning and big data, uh, bolded, I mean, all uppercase because it's a buzzword, because to use those and make a coherent idea of what your network should look like. And if you have this successfully, ideally, when anything happens that shouldn't, you can just detect that as an anomaly. It's this idea of anomaly-based threat detection. It's not designed to get rid of signatures, because signatures are still good, but it's designed to come alongside signatures. And if an attack has never happened, you, there's no way you can have a signature for it. But if an attack revolves around a behavior that never happens on your network, it's very easy to detect, or should be very easy to detect that with uh, user and entity behavior analytics. It applies a lot of interesting concepts, and it's somewhat theoretical, and so I don't know how applicable it is, but it's I, probably the next big direction that security will go. Uh, we're hitting shortcomings with our abilities to write rules simply because it's a cat and mouse game. 
Uh, my rule writing ability is only as good as how good I know the attackers are going to be, and the attackers are constantly getting better. So eventually someone will always bypass your rules. It's just going to happen. But if you have a baseline for what should be happening, then the attackers have a much narrower space for what they can do. Uh, and it's a fairly neat idea. And then another big buzzword, security orchestration automation and response, or SOAR. Um, there's a paper about it, but I can't read the paper because it's behind a paywall, sadly. But it's this idea that SIM is not a powerful enough tool for our analysts. They can't do enough with it, and it doesn't encapsulate all of security with it. And so many times incidents, like I said previously, can be handled automatically. So you should be able to do that with your SOAR framework. The SIM tool is not always aware of what patch versions you're on. And so if an incident comes in that's like screen, a vulnerable version of screen has been exploited on box A, and you don't know if that's on box B, C, or D, this is not, it's very hard to judge the scale of this incident. If that screen exploit can affect every machine in your fleet, that's a bad day. If it can only affect one and that's a dead box, you don't really care. And so without that information, the SIM tool is very lacking. So that's an idea behind incorporating more information. You also have the ability, ideally, to evaluate your security posture. So the, the security posture of a company is how they handle security events and how they handle security problems. And so it's an, it's an idea, it's a framework for how you handle security in general. And that's going to be your process behind instant response, your, pack, your process behind instant re vulnerability remediation, um, all of those big long words that go into infrastructure security, particularly the policy side of it. Uh, don't get incorporated into your SIM tool at all. Your analysts more or less have free reign in the SIM tool, like they can mark issues how they want. The uh, security posture implementation allows you to better track the process of instant response in the tool. Uh, and it's ideally just a centralized source for all things security. And I have found MozDev, which is the Mozilla, Mozilla Defense Framework, which claims to be something like this. I didn't have time to get it spun up, so I'm not really sure. But this is the defense framework that Mozilla is using with all of their infrastructure, which is pretty vast and pretty kind of a big deal because they like write Firefox and all of that. So if you're really interested in this and what could be the next era of security tools uh, that analysts see, MozDev is what I would recommend checking out. I don't know how quiet, how quiet, I don't know how high quality it is. The documentation is very poor, and so you would really just have to have hands on and look at it. It has Docker containers. Did not try them, so I don't know how easy to spin up. But if you're really interested in it, that's what I would recommend. So let's see if we can get this up and running. So the local, the honeypot is running locally, so I should be able to SSH to localhost. Root at localhost. Port, and it runs on 22.22 by default. And once again, this is the sim tool. So currently I'm in a honeypot. If I was an attacker, ideally I'm not aware of this. And I can do things like cat Etsy password. Um, I can try to see what pseudo privileges I have. Uh, I'm root, so that doesn't really matter. Uh, I can do a handful of things. And so as a security analyst, I'd like to be able to track what people are doing in my honeypot. So I can load up Kibana, and I need to refresh, I believe. And once it loads, perhaps it's already ready. So we have this set of information that is now available to me, which is fairly neat. And you can see that every log that we send in is timestamped. And we can also see that everything I have done is now available here in Kibana. So I have a bunch of information that's been gathered. I have the event ID, the host that's been run on, input, uh, message, all sorts of things like that. So if I want, I can check very quickly how what commands have been run. So that's event equals carry command endpoint, so, or input. So any log message that came in with this event ID can then be shown. And so we can see on the current honeypot, only two things have been run, one of which was sudo attack L, and another of which was catting Etsy password. And this seems not super useful, because who cares what they're running on a honeypot? But that's the whole point, is you do care what they're doing 
on the honeypot. If we can, so, and we'll talk about it more as we move into threat intel. But if you have an attacker in a honeypot that ex tries to do a brand new exploit that you've never seen before, and you catch it in your sim tool, you can very quickly build signatures for that attack, and then it's not going to be successful if they do it. Or if they do, you'll catch it immediately. And it's a very neat idea uh, of using sim to then generate new threat intelligence uh, via honeypots. But overall, it's fairly powerful. Ideally, you would use some sort of alerting framework so I could catch things. So I could be able to catch catting Etsy password as a, someone trying to do account, sir, account enumeration, uh, which is fairly neat. And that overall would be done with alerts. And if you're looking at Elasticstack as a SIM tool, Yelp wrote a really neat tool called ElastAlert that just searches Elasticsearch for information and then runs a command based off of it. Uh, it's a fairly neat platform. So back to slides. So threat intelligence, kind of a boring idea. Doesn't really seem to be super useful. Uh, but it comes in a handful of steps, uh, one of which is attribution, which tends to be fairly useful. So you're taking an attack that someone has done, maybe on you, maybe on a honeypot, maybe on someone else, and you're turning that into indicators of compromise. And these are metrics that you can look at, a ser apply to a server. And if, they turn, if the metrics match, ideal or likely you are compromised. And so if that is a user account that has been added uh, for an integrator of compromise, uh, so for example, every time Andrew hacks a box, he adds the user generic because he's not very good at hacking uh, in this hypothetical situation. You could have the user generic being present on the box as an indicator of compromise. So then you move these indicators of compromise into a profile. And so let's say Andrew does other things as well. So we take all of those into this profile. This is how Andrew hacks. And once you can figure out who's doing it, you can very quickly identify what they're going for and their motives likely are. And so for Andrew hacking me, he's probably just trying to embarrass me. But if the state of China is trying to hack me, uh, I'm not sure why, but let's say they're trying to hack me to get all my financial information, the way I should be handling this threat is very different. And what I need to be focusing on protecting and looking for them attacking is very different. Andrew may be looking for pictures of me, whereas China's likely looking for my credentials for my bank account. And so taking this information as a corporation allows you to then distribute to other corporations of the same kind. So if I run a bank and I'm consistently being attacked by China, and other banks are experiencing the same thing. If the Chinese government launches an attack on my bank and we catch it and develop a profile for them and identif identify them as China, I can then distribute that to all the other banks. And so when they're attacked, they very quickly identify it and know what the attackers are going for. It's a fairly neat idea. And it's very actually used. It doesn't sound like security comp organizations would be so willing to impart security knowledge, but in some cases, herd immunity is worth it. And so for some organizations that are a part of organizations that share security information, if you attack one of them, you have essentially attacked all of them, which is a really big deal as far as dissemination of your attacks go. You mess up once and you no longer are your attacks even viable. It's a very, very neat concept when done well. So we talk about distribution. A lot of times this is not done in a technical fashion. This can be done via conference calls that happen once a week. But there are protocols and systems in place to do it. It's fairly neat. Uh, STIX, which is the Structured Threat Information Expression, is a file format designed to take in indicators of compromise and distribute them to other people. And that's a fairly handy, OK, this all sounds really dumb. I will agree. When I first saw it, I was like, why are we doing this? Uh, but we'll get to something neat as we come up. And so then we have TAXI, which is that long acronym, which is a way to distribute this information. And so I can publish a taxi server, and y'all can subscribe, and y'all can see every indicator of compromise that I publish. And an example of this is the Alien Vault Open Thread Exchange. If you haven't signed up, it's actually fairly neat. You don't have to be running in any, in any infrastructure to do it. And they distribute interesting attacks that are going on. So like once a week or once every couple days, I get an email from new attacks that have been going on. And so whenever a new botnet comes out, uh, Alien Vault generally distributes a message on OTX and says, hey, this is this, this is this malware. This is what it's doing, and this is how we're detecting it. It's a really, really easy way to be caught up on how attackers are attacking. And so now we get to the actual interesting part. So we've done all this classification on our threat actors. We have all this great information on how they attack. How is that useful to us? MITRE developed what they call the attack framework, 
which is taking what was Lockheed Hart Martin's uh, cyber kill chain and moving it into a more or less fully fledged idea of what an attacker may want to do on your network. It's not comprehensive, but it is fairly close. And it's taking these IOCs and pu putting them into a well-defined format and then writing scripts to simulate those. And so that's exactly what Caldera does. Uh, they, they, they demoed it, I think, in 2017, Black Hat in Europe. And it's a network that you spin up and you can install their agents on your Windows machines. It's currently, at least the last time I checked, only on Windows. And then you can pick things out of the attack kill chain. So they're trying, to, let's say they try to enumerate users. Uh, they use Mimikatz to dump credentials and then they do specific actions to the DC. You pull these individual things together to make a threat profile or an attacker profile. And then it actually runs that attack on your network, simulating it basically any attacker you want based off the attacks that you can do. And you can then check your SIM tool in all of your security infrastructure to make sure that you caught it. And that's, in my opinion, incredibly powerful. It took all of this information that I at least personally thought was really stupid and useless and allowed us to apply it and simulate attacks from pretty much anyone you want. If you find out that North Korea is attacking in this specific way and you have an idea of how to simulate that, you can use this framework to check and make sure North Korea is going to have a hard time hacking you. It's really, really neat. I don't know if anyone's using it in production yet because it's really new software, uh, but this video here is a demo of them using it. The software is fairly polished and straightforward. I would really recommend at least watching the video if that interests you. Uh, it's fairly neat. So we're finally on to hunting. Uh, the kind of the newest area of security that I have seen. I don't know how many people have been doing it for a long time, but I know currently it's somewhat at the forefront along with artificial intelligence with UBA. It's the idea of taking all of the information you have stored and trying to identify threats before your SIM tool is going to. This is likely going to revolve around attacking people early in the cyber kill chain or catching attackers early in the cyber kill chain. So not, cyber kill chain generally ends with action on objectives, which means they're actively hacking you. Prior to that is establishing persistence, things like that. Hunting is generally trying to catch people way back here where your SIM tool is not going to do it or probably can't currently. So you're trying to look for that with a handful of ways. And there's a lot of ways to do it. I'm only going to cover two simply because it's probably more of an art than a science. It's people trying to guess what hackers are doing, which has some, it has some metric of guesswork. You're not necessarily going to get it every time, nor are you going to be able to be repeatable with this. But it's an overall idea of how you can use your infrastructure to help you hunt. So for performance monitoring, it's fairly easy to check for attacks via variances in performance data. If someone's trying to brute force one of your servers, you should notice a spike in traffic over port 22, which is very, very easy to detect as far as performance data goes. And so I'll give you all an example, but if you're looking to set anything up like this, I would recommend Grafana as the front end because it's really pretty and nice. Uh, wonderful graphs, and I love wonderful graphs. Storage, you can do a time series database, so InfluxDB and Graphite. Uh, and then collection is going to be fairly standard infra industry infrastructure monitoring, so Prometheus or Telegraph. So to give you an idea of what that will look like, if I can pull up here, demo.grafana. Oh. And you can pull this up as well. This is a public facing demo, oh, play.grafana. And so that this is an idea of what you would be seeing on your metrics monitoring dashboard. And you can see that like server requests are going on here. You can see your CPU load, the number of logins, so things like this would be very easy to use to correlate to possible attacks. So if the number of logins suddenly spikes, that's very easy to think, huh, I wonder why the number of logins suddenly went up really high. Probably an attacker. And of course, you have to correlate this data with actual going ons. It could be a non-malicious actor. It could be a stupid user who logged in a bunch of times because they have a bad computer or something like that. Uh, but it's a useful way to start actually discovering attackers before your SIM tool does. And this is fairly standard. Most industries, most infrastructure guys, so this would be more the, the system admin administrators, should be running a monitoring platform of some sort. If you run a network of more than 15 computers and you don't have monitoring, you're going to hate yourself because you just can't. Machines can die three weeks ago and you don't even know because you're not monitoring it. And it's very frustrating. Uh, and so this should be available if you're dealing with a decent sized company. And you're just using that metrics to fuel security. And my favorite overall, probably the highlight of the presentation in my opinion, is monitoring system state. 
And this is not an easy thing, at least in my opinion, or at least it wasn't. It's the idea of how do we check my fleet of 100 machines and see what's going on in them right now. And that's not necessarily the process level, but in the configuration level. So how do I know what version of screen, because that's my go-to, is installed on every machine? How do I query that quickly and easily? And a fairly normal way to do this is use a configuration management solution like Puppet. And you say, well, Puppet ran updates. And so we can check our Puppet DB, which stores a bunch of information about the Puppet run, and see what software was installed. But you have somewhat of a problem here. Because any sort of configuration management solution is likely only going to tell you what was installed. And so if an attacker came on and changed things, or if anything happened that happened poorly in the deploy that wasn't caught, the configuration data you have is not directly pulled from the machine. And so you may have an issue with the history of the data. And Facebook come out with a really neat solution to this problem called OS Query, which is, um, I'll just demo it because it's really neat. But it's this idea of taking the information on your system and attempting to query that like a database. If any of y'all are familiar with, one moment, I don't remember the correct flags for this. If any of y'all are familiar with SQL, the idea is turning your con entire system's configuration, or maybe not the entire thing, but the majority of it, into a SQL-like queryable database, which at first glance is not very powerful, but it allows you to do very powerful things in the end. And so once again, I just cloned their quick start repo to demo this. It's very easy to do. Uh, this requires you just run that one command, and it sets itself up, which is really handy. So if we can check again, I need to know how to add hosts. It even allows you to add hosts as a demo. So we can say add hosts is 10. So now it'll spin up 10 hosts into our instance. And this allows you to rough. I don't know if it ran. OK, maybe it's up. This may fail, unfortunately. Local. Let's see if we can get fleet. Mm, I don't remember what port it's on. 8412. Yeah, OK. So this is the Collide dashboard. Uh, Collide is a web interface to all of your OS query instances on your host. Uh, and OS query is what is allowing you to do these queries. Fleet just distributes these queries across the area. So we can create a new query. And they give you the example, which I don't really want to use. But if you ever use SQL, it's very similar to that. So we can select star from uh, anything we want. So let's start with dev packages, because that one I found very neat. Select star from dev packages. And so we can check right now, after we add a target, of course. So let's add all of my hosts and run it. It's going to take this query and run it on every system that I specified. So we can now quickly check what is installed by the package manager on every single box that we're running, which is fairly neat. If we think that we have a problem with screen, uh, for those of you who didn't know, I've been mentioning screen a lot. Within the last couple of years, screen was used for a root privilege escalation vulnerability, and screen's a very popular software. So odds are, if you have a box that you haven't touched in the last two years, probably someone can probably very quickly pop to root. If you check ExploitDB, really easy shell script that works basically every time to get root via screen, uh, if it's an old screen, which is fairly neat. But we can say where name equals screen. So this will check and see what is on all of my boxes. Do I have screen installed? which is that this is running in a default Ubuntu Docker container. So I don't think I do, uh, but I may. And it takes a little while to run. And we can see we returned zero records. So nothing was installed. No, no screen was installed, so we don't have to worry about patches. One of the demos we did was, or one of the attacks that we had to do on Saturday in the penetration testing was uh, DNS poisoning via Etsy hosts. So the idea is an attacker puts a malicious entry in Etsy hosts, and they use that to redirect all of your non-verified queries. So like HTTP traffic can be re redirected and used maliciously. So if we select star from Etsy hosts, we can check the entirety of, Etsy, of the Etsy hosts file for our entire fleet very quickly. 
So if one of your indicators of compromise is that someone enters in your Etsy host file uh, a malicious entry that goes away, that points to one of their servers, let's say they repoint google.com because you're using Google over HTTP for some reason. You can very quickly with this check that. Super, super powerful software. Uh, really, really handy if you're trying to quickly identify a problem that was just released. When they came out with the, this is probably not a super apt example because everyone was vulnerable, but when they released the issue that came out with Spectre and Meltdown, and you know the kernel version, you can quickly query with OS query across your entire fleet what the kernel version is of every single box that's running, and you can identify if you're vulnerable in that moment. Very, very powerful. Um, stuff, I, I manage the network over at the Honors College. I wish we were running that software over there, and I plan to deploy it as soon as possible. Because just from an infrastructure side, it allows you to check if updates haven't been happening. And that's also really great from a security perspective. If you're not actively checking to make sure the updates happened, you can't guarantee they didn't. Uh, Yumcron, which is a really nice utility for checking or consistently updating a CentOS box, works. But unless you configure it to tell you, it will fail silently. And so you don't know that you haven't been getting updates for the last year. Uh, OS query stops that from happening if you query it. And then, of course, like all tools, you can then just feed this information into your SIM tool, and you have plenty of information uh, that you can do with whatever you want. Can we trust Facebook's OS query with having elevated privs on our systems? Uh, I would say so. I do believe it's open source. Yeah, I'm like fair, I'm like 90% confident it's open source. So if you're afraid of OS query by Facebook on your system as root, just check the source. Uh, it's there. Otherwise, there's enough people using it that I am, I would run it on my systems as root and not feel any qualms about it. And that's it. That is the wrap up of network security. Uh, Y'all have any questions? Good to go. Uh, we're going to be doing domain hacking next. So if you're interested in that, come out next week. Be intro introduction to Windows Active Directory. And then, as always, Thursdays at 4, we have our open labs where you can come hang out and ask us questions and pretty much do whatever. Thank you all for coming.